We have been speaking about the different types of church planters, and we've already described the pastoral church planter, and that is the type of church planter that probably most of us are familiar with. The church planter has been trained in Bible school or a seminary. Um, he goes into the location. He basically gets the church started and serves as pastor. He does the preaching, he does the teaching, and the counseling, and most of the ministry responsibilities. And it either stays there long term as the church becomes established, or when that church gets large enough to pay its own pastor and expenses, the church planter moves on. And we've said that works fairly well in places where uh, the church grows quickly, where people have resources to be able to pay for a pastor, and where there are trained people available. But it usually doesn't lead to churches reproducing very quickly because it's very dependent on a lot of resources, highly trained people. And then we described the catalytic church planter. And this would be the church planter that starts one church that grows, becomes a very large church, well-established. And that church then, in turn, plants many other churches. They'll keep sending out people, maybe 20 people here, 20 people there. Keeps reproducing churches that way. And the church planter stays in that initially established church, but the vision uh, of this person is especially gifted to be able to motivate, to be send out new people to start those new churches. And that works fairly well if you have a very gifted church planter who can grow that church where there's responsiveness and uh, where he is gifted enough to continue to motivate people to send out people to start new churches. That happens less often. And it usually is more effective in urban areas where you are able to collect people from a large region in one large church and then in those different sections of the city or the urban area you start these daughter churches. And then there is what we want to talk about in this session is the apostolic church planter. Now this is the type of church planter that most of us have probably never really seen uh, or observed and our school Bible schools and seminaries rarely teach people how to be this kind of a church planter. And so I'm going to spend a little more time on this because I believe, although it doesn't necessarily fit everywhere, I do believe that this type of church planter often leads to the most rapid reproduction of churches and the empowerment of people to actually saturate regions. And it may be suited for urban or rural areas. So what do we mean when we talk about an apostolic church planter? Well, we use the word apostolic in the sense of the Apostle Paul. And when we look at the Apostle Paul, as we've already done, we find out that he would enter a city, he would preach, he would gather the initial core of those new believers, he would teach them, but fairly quickly, usually within less than a year often, he would appoint the elders and leaders from those new believers that would stay with that church, they would become the leaders who stay behind, and then Paul and his team would move on. And even though they would have continued contact through visits or by writing letters or sending other co-workers to visit those churches, the apostolic church planner does not place himself as the pastor of that church. In fact, his whole goal is to raise up the local people to be their own leaders and pastors and then to move on. And so the key feature is this, the church planter does not pastor the church, but equips local leaders to pastor and then move on. Now the strengths of this type of an approach is that it facilitates multiplication because you're reproducing workers as you're planting the church. So it's not dependent on just one person who's highly trained with all the gifts and skills to give leadership to that church, but you're raising and you're building the church really with the people and the gifts that they have. And there's local ownership. In other words, because the church planter is more itinerant, because that church planter is not going to stay there for 10 or 20 years, the local people have that sense, this is our ministry, and it's growing with them and their gifts. See, sometimes the way traditionally church plants have gone forward, especially when there's foreign missionaries, as the church begins to grow, sometimes the people will say something like, well, gee, we'd like to start a youth ministry. Can you have another missionary sent to start the youth group? 
And so the missionary writes home and the recruits, maybe somebody from America will come and start a youth ministry. And they say, well, we'd like to expand and do women's ministry and so on. Well, is there somebody? And maybe another missionary gets sent to do that. And what they end up learning is that ministry is done by highly trained people who are paid, usually paid from somewhere else, from some mission organization. And we, uh, we really can't do this kind of thing ourselves. And so please serve us. And then when those missionaries say, well, we need to leave, what happens? People go, well, what do we do? What do we do? We don't have anybody to do all these ministries you've been doing. So the apostolic church planners really saying, oh, you think you would like to have a children's ministry? Who in this group can we train to help lead a children's ministry? Oh, you'd like to start a youth outreach. Who has a vision? Who might have gifts for youth outreach? And then you say, well, I think it's Peter over here. And Peter says, what, me? No, I've never done that before, right? Um, and he said, well, yeah, that's true. You've never done that before. And actually, maybe I've never really done it that much, but we'll learn together. And so you help Peter and you get this thing started and he's actually becoming the leader of it. So you see, then when the church planter leaves, Peter's the leader of that group. There's not this vacuum. You see, the problem with the pastoral model is if the pastoral church planner leaves, there's a vacuum because he's not trained up the local people to give leadership to that church. Now, the weakness of this approach is that it is initially slower. See, in some ways, it's just faster to have a professional person come and start that youth ministry or start that women's group. And you can get it up and going more quickly. Um, we can import some some workers or recruit somebody to come and do this, or we can raise some money and um, pay to have this happen. But so it is slower in the beginning. The other thing is, of course, it is dependent on the willingness and the giftedness of the people who you're training up to do these ministries. And I understand that sometimes things are difficult. They go slowly. One of the church plants we were involved in in Germany really had no mature believers at all. They were all new believers. Many of them came out of life situations that were difficult. And so it was, uh, it was a very slow process to really try and raise up and empower those local leaders. It was slow and difficult. And so I understand that uh, I'm not going to tell you that this is the ideal way this will always work. But I do believe that in many, if not most cases, this basic approach is an approach that will lead to, in the long run, a stronger church and has more potential to reproduce churches. Why? Because you're reproducing workers as you plant the church. And it's not always the reproduction of this church will not always be dependent on having professional paid church planters and ministries uh, to expand the work. Now, let me give you a couple of examples of this type of uh, church planting. Um, and many of these examples uh, come from the majority world, from Africa, Asia, Latin America. But I think that there are, are also ways to adapt this that will work in Western culture, European, North American settings, and basically in principle. Well, Glenn Kendall, he actually worked in Rwanda with a rapidly growing movement. He actually wrote an article some years ago that was called, um, had the title, uh, Missionaries Should Not Plant Churches. Um, so he's uh, already being a little provocative in the way he, he writes this. And I'm just going to quote to you. He describes a situation which is fairly common. And um, this was in uh, Evangelical Missions Quarterly, and, and I quote this in our book. Um, he describes this way. Bob set out to plant a church, and he succeeded, albeit slowly, because none of his people had training or experience. Bob did almost all of the preaching and teaching. His people generously affirmed his ministry. They weren't ready to assume his role, and he wasn't eager to give it up. He has invested 15 years in this church, and he didn't want to release control too soon and risk a failure. So see, this is the fear. Oh, gee, you know, the people aren't ready yet, and if I leave, this will all collapse, right? Jeff, on the other hand, facilitated starting of churches. He motivated and trained people to do it. He wasn't up front every Sunday. He encouraged new Christians and developed leaders from the beginning. 
He would not start church services unless he had nationals to lead them. Jeff's ministry expanded as he drew out leaders to take over. Bob's ministry dragged on. He thought it would take another 10 years before he had responsible leaders. You see the difference? So Jeff was saying, I'm going to empower the local people. We're not even going to start new ministries if there aren't local people able to take at least some of the responsibility. Let me give you an example of this. Uh, I was traveling in Eastern Europe. I, I used to do a lot of consulting with church planters and national movements in Eastern Europe in, this, in the 1990s, uh, late 90s. Uh, all, everything was new. And so um, I visited one church plant. There was an expatriate missionary who had, was sort of giving leadership, but he was, he was not very well theologically trained. And um, uh, he, they were having services every two weeks. This was a little church with maybe about 30 adults. Well, I just happened to be there when they were having a meeting and they were discussing how can we have weekly services? Because this missionary, really his language is not very good. He was only able to preach every couple weeks and that was a big challenge for him. And so they're saying, well, how can we start weekly services? Well, can we have another missionary come? Um, the idea that maybe some of them could give leadership and become preachers was sort of a scary thought that none of them were really very eager to pursue. But I said, well, let's explore this. What if our missionary preaches every second week like he's kind of been doing, but then in the other weeks, he helps one of you, one of these lay people, to learn how to preach and to preach that message? And say there's two of you, so if two of you were able to do that just once a month, because these people are hardworking people, they've got jobs, they're working 50 hours a week. I said, but if, could you preach once a month if somebody helped you? And they said, well, I'd be willing to try. How about you? Would you be willing to try once a month? Well, if somebody helped me, I'd be willing to try. And what ended up happening is they said, well, then what about the fifth Sunday in the month? Well, what do we do? Well, let's have a communion Sunday and we'll, we don't have to have a full sermon. Okay, okay, that's an idea. Oh, and wait a minute, there's another church um, that's only about a half an hour away from here and they're in the same situation. Now, how about if one of their people came and preached in your church and one of our people went and preached in their church, then that sermon you could prepare, you could preach it two times and you'd be building a relationship with that other church and you'd be strengthening your, your, your preaching abilities and so on. Well, so by the end of the day, we'd gone through this scenario and we said, you know what? See, we can expand this ministry with the gifts that are right in the room. And that was empowering to those people. And so they eventually moved on to having weekly services and empowering the local people to take more leadership. Now with time, um, that church uh, uh, could call a pastor if they have the resources and they have a person they feel they want to, to call and be able to pay to be a, a paid minister, they could do that. But they wouldn't have to. And what is more, there's the potential of those people who they've trained up to do preaching and teaching and so on to become the leaders of the next church plant. Remember what we said about the Apostle Paul? He raised up workers from the harvest for the harvest. When we were planting our church in North Munich, and I'll explain sort of the whole story about the way the Munich church has developed later, but when we were planting that church in North Munich, that was a daughter church. There was an established church in the center of the city and we went to the north. We took about 30 people, started a new church. But we said, if we want to start more churches and really reach this area, we've got to empower lay people to be at least the initial church planters. And so the first daughter church we started from North Munich was lay led. There was a person who lived in, uh, outside of the city in a region where there were several, a number of believers. In fact, he'd already started an evangelistic Bible study and, and things were moving forward out there. And we said, okay, let's start a church out there, but I'm not going to pastor that church. I will come and coach you. So I would meet monthly with this lay person and then I would meet monthly with a leadership team in that town 
of the believers to help them plan and, and prepare. And I said, and maybe I'll preach once a month but you will be the people who actually plant this church, and I'll just be coaching you. And that church developed, and that church grew. Eventually, they called a pastor half-time that they could afford to pay. And then a few years later, they paid that pastor full-time. So eventually, they did have a pastor. But we empowered the local people. Now, if we had to wait until we had a full-time paid church planter with a seminary education to go plant that church, might not be planted to this day. And so the idea of empowering local people to take the initiative, to learn to develop their gifts and uh, plant churches is going to be a key. And this apostolic model really is based upon that, that concept. George Patterson, um, there's a little chapter in the book, uh, Perspectives on the World uh, Christian Movement. And he describes his work in Honduras. He worked there for about 20 years and through empowerment of local believers, they were able to plant roughly 100 house churches in a 20-year period. But the whole system was based on training ordinary local people to take the initiative and give leadership. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. David Garrison in his book, Church Planting Movements, describes this. He says that the church planter might help planting the first church and getting a movement started, but very quickly needs to move to the role of equipping others to be the real church planters and being a coach. And so this is one of the keys to rapidly growing church planting movements, is that they are basically lay-led, lay-driven, and the church planter is the one who actually becomes the equipper, a facilitator of church planting. Tom Steffen worked in the Philippines in, uh, in a tribal work, and he wrote a book some years ago called Passing the Baton. And the whole thesis of this book is that when the church planter enters, he's initially immediately thinking, how will I work myself out of a job? And that doesn't necessarily come by saying, well, how do we raise enough money to pay somebody else to do it? But how do we empower the local people? He'd observed the, the traditional way of doing it, where the missionary comes in, plants a church and stays there for years and years and years, and uh, somehow the people never seem to be far enough along that the missionary can leave. He took a very different approach, and his book is structured on this idea. A couple of other examples um, that uh, we cite in, in our book. Um, here's one from India, and this one comes from the Lausanne Occasional Paper number 43. Um, in 1992, an indigenous Indian mission began missionary ef efforts in Uttar Pradesh, India's most populous state. The original approach was the old missionary model, and these are Indian church planters. Uh, the church planter lived in a town, held services in his home, conducted other meetings. After 10 years, the effort produced about 700 believers in 10 fields. So that's not too bad. However, in, in 2002, the strategy was changed and a more apostolic model was adopted. In the, year, in the first year, the church planter will plant fellowships in 10 villages. 10 villages in the first year, train a leader for every village fellowship, and then hand over that fellowship to him. The missionary moves to another 10 villages in the following year, equipping local lay leaders was central to the strategy. And so the result was that within one year, the number of fellowships grew from 65 to 130, and the number of believers grew to 1,500. Thus, through the adoption of the new approach, the accomplishments of 10 previous years were more than doubled in 12 months. Now, of course, we always ask the question, well, how strong were these churches? Can that really happen? Um, and of course, here's where, again, if we look at the Apostle Paul, he didn't just abandon these churches after they were initially started. There was follow-up. There were people like Apollos who went in and continued to teach. There were letters being written to correct issues that were in trouble. 
But, and, and of course, all the churches that Paul planted were not exactly your ideal churches. Anybody want to plant a church like the church in Corinth? Um, that was a bit of a problem, wasn't it? Yet, Paul continued with that basic sort of approach. Because in the long run, it is going to reach more people, empower more people, and plant more churches. We could go on and on with various examples of this type of approach. And you may be thinking, well, that might work in the Philippines, that might work in Honduras, that might work in India. Can that really work where I'm working? Well, you may not have the same rapid kind of response that some of these other places had. But I do believe, even in places where the response to the gospel is slower, the concept of empowering local people is a real key to church health, and even if it's slower, to church reproduction.